Hey there folks, <clears throat> going to tell you a story about a guy today, <clears throat> his name is Gary Bikirk, he was born in uh, 47, he's working in New England, I think New Hampshire or somewhere like that, and <clears throat> parents divorced when he was four years old, lived with various aunts things like that throughout most of his childhood. Never really had any uh, you know, male figure to look up to, so he kind of figured out his own way in life and figured out what was important to him and that kind of thing on his own. <clears throat> in 66, this would have been when he was 19, he decided to sign up for the Army a, he had been in college and a <laughs> girlfriend had dumped him so he figured he would go you know go do something manly besides getting dumped by a girlfriend I guess you know so buddy tried to get him to join the marines he said no he was going to join the army he wanted to be a green beret because he had read read books about the green berets and things like that and so he joined the army, <clears throat> asked to sign up for the Green Berets, and they said, well, we can't do that, but we can get you into you know, airborne infantry, basically jump school. He said, sure, so he did that, <clears throat> went through the process, qualified for Green Beret, uh, went through that whole training scenario, became a medic. So a, a special operations Green Beret medic. These guys were very... They held a lot of respect by the people that they served with. They were, they were very esteemed. And rightly so. But the thing that made him a medic, the thing that drove him to be a medic is he, he just wanted to help people. He wanted to be somebody that was you know kind of the dichotomy of being a special operations medic is you have to know how to kill people and you have to know how to save people at the same time um, so he went through that he ended up I want to say he went to Germany and then he like the um, gentleman in our last video asked to be transferred to Vietnam and they accommodated him rather quickly. I believe that's correct with, with uh, Gary Bykirk as well. And he showed up in Vietnam in 69, I believe. I believe it was 69. Or maybe it was just after the... No, it was 69. Served, and he, he was placed... Um, I can't remember the name of the town or the province that he was in. Daxong, I think. Anyway, it's really, it was three miles from the Ho Chi Minh Trail up in the highlands in northern, in the northern highlands. Not a very safe place to be. Kind of like if you were, you know, you had an acre of farmland and you had a bunch of beehives on it and you were afraid of bees instead of sitting your chair on the other side of the field you set it on top of one of the hives that's kind of where they were they were right in the danger zone he was embedded in some of the tribal mountain yard peoples there were thousands of them in this village that they lived in and there were 12 green berets that were there living with them and they were basically cut off from the rest of the war the rest of the world and they had access for you know radios and calling in artillery and all that stuff but they didn't they didn't eat in mess halls they didn't you know have r and r at uh, china beach and that kind of stuff they lived their entire time in Vietnam in these villages they became part of these villages well 
the mountain yards from the age of 12 were considered combatants. They were fighting age at age of 12. And Bikert defended, not defended, befriended this young guy named Dow. He was, he was 14 when he first knew him. He was 15 at the end of the story. <clears throat> Dow became his his right-hand man, his bodyguard, his security, his eyes, his ears, everything. I mean, where one went, the other one went. And they became very close. Then on April 1st, 1970, the North Vietnamese attacked this outpost where they were at. There were women, children, Twelve special operations guys, Green Berets, and all these other mountain yards, and they attacked heavily with heavy, um, heavy weapons, heavy you know rockets, 122 millimeter rockets, all this stuff. They just rained down on them for about two hours, and in the process, one of one of By Kirk's Green Berets <clears throat> got hit out in the field and there was about 200 yards between the camp and the, the barbed wire enclosure and then beyond that was just thick jungle you couldn't couldn't move in, couldn't see anything so he went out to get this guy and he got hit with a 122 millimeter rocket didn't directly hit him. The shrapnel went into his spine and basically paralyzed him immediately. And Dow was with him. And he and Dow and another another mountain yard drug him and this other guy back to the, the camp and got him medical treatment. <clears throat> well, Bikirk was... Like I said, was paralyzed, and he made up his mind that if he's going to die, he's going to die out there, not down here in the medical tent. So he got Dow and another guy to carry him. They, you know, had his arms over their shoulders, dragging him through the this firefight that was going on. And he went out <clears throat> and would tend to people that had injuries, uh, pulled a couple back. Uh, he was in the process of pulling back a, a Vietnamese soldier when he was shot through the back again they took him back into the little medical thing when he got there his he had grievous injuries that they were bad like you're gonna die bad so they you know basically patched him up a little bit and he went back out kept going back out tending to these people until finally he was injured a third time and he passed out <clears throat> They brought him back. He finally agreed to have medical treatment. Uh, he has a fuzzy memory of that time, of how long he was there from the start of that battle until he was medevaced out. One of his Green Beret friends said he was medevaced out on the first day, but he remembers events that happened on the second day. So it's a little fuzzy of how long he was there, but he believes he was there for well over 24 hours and his injuries his first injury occurred about two hours into the battle so he goes to the hospital in Vietnam uh, goes to a hospital in Japan and he eventually makes it back to a hospital in the States manages to recover enough to be put back on active duty as a kind of a clerk didn't really agree with him you know that that line of work didn't really agree with him so he opted out of the army got an early out to go back to college so this was in 1970 still goes back to college uh, experiences some of the same crap that so many of our veterans experienced people treating him poorly that kind of thing so he left college again and he drove up into New England and some out of the way road and he found a cave and he decided that he was going to live in that cave and he did so for several months he had a post office box in town 
and I'm going to kind of combine a bunch of his story right here. He he decided to become to to go to seminary school because he wanted to go back to Vietnam to be a missionary to these Montagnard people. And before that could occur, the war ended. Vietnam fell, so he was kind of crushed by that. But he ended up becoming a pastor and then got a degree in counseling. But while he was living in that cave, <laughs> long hair, you know, he was, he was like a mountain man kind of thing. He had a note in his P.O. box that there was a very important phone call and he needed to be in this particular tavern or whatever it was at this certain time. So he went there. He's sitting there having a drink or tacos or whatever, I don't know. Phone rings. The guy says, is there a Gary Bykirk here? He answers it. The guy asks him, are you Gary Bykirk that was with the uh, this particular unit, Special Operations, Green Beret? Were you in this... This campsite, were you there on April 1st, 1970? Yes, 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 yes. Well, I have the <clears throat> privilege of letting you know that you've been written up for to receive the Medal of Honor. And he's like, oh, okay. Can you come to Washington? Yeah, I can, I can do that. He was going through some serious difficulties at that point, reconciling what he had been through and getting back into normal life. He had, he had been awarded Silver Star and various other medals, and he kind of saw this as recognition for something that brought him back to Vietnam, and he was through with that. So he wasn't terribly excited about the process goes to Washington like he looks probably like me with long hair and they said we're not going to make you get your hair cut but if you want to receive this in your uniform you have to be fully in uniform which means haircut shave that kind of stuff otherwise you have to wear civilian clothes well he was the special opera the green berets were very dear to his heart so he readily agreed to cut his hair and all that stuff and he was he was given the medal by President Nixon this was in 75, no, 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 70, 74, because Nixon wasn't there in 75. I believe it was in 74. Him and I think eight other people were awarded the Medal of Honor that day. And he put it in, a, in his duffel bag and pretty much tried to forget about it for quite some time. And then he came to realize what it meant to him. And not only what it meant to him, but what it represented, what, what it symbolized and all that stuff. And he finally came to grips with it. And to him, it symbolized all those people that had died, that had actually given their lives and made the ultimate sacrifice, the pinnacle of honor. And it also represented to him... <clears throat> his connection with God it's like God saved me from that for something higher and there was he had a, a friend in the clergy that told him when you receive this honor don't stoop to be a king when God has called you to be a servant don't lower yourself down <clears throat> to be this king with this big medal that nobody else has when God has called you to be a servant. And that stuck with him. And like I said, he went on to, to get a degree in counseling and he spent 33 years as a middle school counselor in, uh, I believe it was New Hampshire. 33 years as a middle school counselor. And he said he, <clears throat> he owed his dedication to all those kids to Dow, who was 15 when and Dow died <clears throat> in the process of saving uh, Sergeant Bykirk. And he wanted to, to impart to kids how big of a change they could make in the world or even in someone's life 
as young as they were. And he used that example. He said this was the most the most meaningful, I can't remember the words he used. Um, anyway, I'll think of it. Most meaningful person in his life. And <clears throat> he spent the rest of his career trying to impart that to kids. And he reached hundreds, if not thousands, of kids that needed help and needed to be told that that they were worth something and they had something to give the world and that kind of thing. And he's extremely proud of that fact. And he says that, you know, that along with being a Medal of Honor recipient and what he went through in Vietnam uh, gave his life meaning. <clears throat> he uses a different word. So there's a difference between success and significance. That's the word he uses gave him significance and his goal in life became being significant to other people and teaching them to be significant to, to others and to make something of their lives and to, to be meaningful to society and that's it's just an unbelievable to me um, path that led him to that to, to find meaning he, he could have been anything he could have been a career army guy he could have pr pretty much done anything he wanted he pulled himself up from living in a cave to go be this person that was so significant in so many other people's lives and uh, Sergeant Gary Bykirk thank you Thank you not only for what you went through, for being willing to go through that, the choices that you made when you could have just laid in the medical tent and said to hell with it, the choices you made to come out of that cave, the choices you made to get a degree and to make the impact on people's lives. Thank you for all of that. Thank you for what you've done for our freedom. Thank you for what you've done for the direction of this country. And thank you for being so willing to share your story in so many different places. It means a lot. You touched a lot of people. I'm one of them. So there you go. Sergeant Gary Bykirk, thank you.